On behalf of the Center for International Policy Studies at the University of Ottawa, uh, I would like to welcome everybody, our speakers and participants for joining us today. My name is Anna Bojek, I'm the SIPS coordinator, and it is our great pleasure today to welcome everybody for our webinar entitled Our Conversation with Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, Current Situation and the Best Practices for Protecting Future Assistance to Afghanistan. Today's event is featuring keynote speaker John Sopko, a U.S. Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, and discussant Daryl Copeland, former diplomat and professor. Today's event was coordinated by Dr. Nipa Banerjee, who is a senior fellow and professional in residence with the School of International Development and Globalization at the University of Ottawa. She has worked in international development and foreign aid for over 35 years, namely with the Canadian International Development Agency, and has headed Canada's aid programs in a number of Asian countries, including Afghanistan. I would just like to mention that today's uh, event is uh, record, being recorded. We will have the recording available in a few days and we'll be sharing the link with everyone. Um, and during the event, I will also share with you a, a link to the SIPS page. We have a dedicated page to the situation in Afghanistan with a number of blogs and event recordings. Um, so I will also invite everybody to take a look at that. Uh, once again, thank you, everybody. And I would now like to invite Dr. Nipa Banerjee and take, to take over. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Good morning to you all. I welcome all on behalf of the Fragile States Research Network and Asian Studies Network of the Center for International Policy Studies, or SIPS. Special welcomes to John Sopko, the U.S. Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction and Canada's very own Daryl Copeland. Welcome back, John. You have given us the pleasure of hosting you as the keynote speaker on several occasions in the past. Thank you for joining us again at a critical time. Actually, John Sopko hardly needs any introduction to this audience, yet to observe the protocol, I will introduce him briefly focusing on his critical role in the oversight, investigation, and audit of reconstruction work in Afghanistan. John Sopko has over three decades of experience in oversight and investigations as a prosecutor, congressional counsel, and senior federal government advisor. He was appointed by President Obama as the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, SIGAR, in 2012, and had since then provided appropriate and aggressive oversight of Afghanistan's transition period. The critical problem that the US and other bilateral and international donor agencies confronted in Afghanistan was the inability to properly oversee the projects they financed often resulting in the waste of the funds invested. SIGAR's investigative and audit role filled this gap. SIGAR reports provided the policymakers with the information and the related analyses to make informed decisions. SIGAR's lessons learned reports are aggressive and hard hitting and provide recommendations to improve the effectiveness efficiency and sustainability of Afghanistan's current and future reconstruction efforts. The words of John Sopko, the Inspector General, had been ringing alarm bells for years. As an eager consumer of cigar reports, I found most lessons identified for American reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan pertinent for Canadian investments as well. Most of the cigars hard hitting reports, however, fell on deaf ears. Afghanistan's total collapse last year underscores the merits of cigars work. John Sopko's presentation to us today on the best practices for future donor investments in Afghanistan is based on the lessons learned over the last 10 years, during which cigar issued over 600 reports, conducted over 1,000 criminal and civil investigations, leading to the convictions of more than 160 persons, 
and saved the U.S. taxpayer over $4 billion. John, I request you to take the position to make the, to take the podium uh, to make your presentation now. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, uh, Nipa and uh, Anna. I want to thank you and Nipa for inviting me today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back, and uh, I only uh, uh, wish it could be in person, and maybe we'll have that opportunity later in the year. Uh, after the one year anniversary of the Kabul taking over, uh, of the, Afghan, the Taliban taking over the government there. Uh, as many of you know, and as uh, uh, Nipa alluded to, uh, this is the third time I've had the privilege to be invited to speak before the center. I was scheduled uh, to return late, late March, 2020, uh, but had to cancel just as I think you had to cancel schools uh, up there because we all began to learn that the term social distancing uh, was more than what happens when you realize your crazy uncle shows up at the wedding. Uh, I'm back, but I, again, it's not live and I only wish it could be. Uh, when I came to the center the first time, nearly five years ago to this date, I shared then my concerns regarding the perilous state of the Afghan security forces the persistent insidious corruption eating away at Afghan institutions and how the Afghan government and its military were merely a house of cards, unsustainable without billions in international donations. In August of last year, we watched the Afghan military and government collapse live on TV. I found no solace in the fact that my agency's long-standing warnings about the shaky underpinnings of the Afghan government and military had been all too prescient. A tragedy truly befell the Afghan people on August 15th, one that's forcing many right now out in Afghanistan to fight for their survival facing extreme humanitarian problems. Last week, the UN made an urgent appeal of the donor community for billions of dollars in humanitarian aid for the Afghan people. $2.4 billion was pledged. So international assistance appears to still be flowing. But sending money into Afghanistan is far more complex now than it has ever been. It is vital that this money not fall into the hands of the Taliban and other organizations uh, that may not be interested in the outcome of uh, helping the Afghan people. Massive assistance may be needed, but without placing conditions to ensure it gets to needy Afghans rather than uh, felons, crooks, or whomever, uh, I can assure you that significant amounts will likely be lost to waste, fraud, and abuse. So what I urge the audience to keep in mind is that oversight must be an integral part of any future aid distribution. And it must be embedded from the minute funds leave donors' respective treasuries to the moment it reaches the needy Afghans uh, 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 there. I'll go into this in greater detail, but, but let me just give you a little bit of the background of who I am and who SIGAR is, particularly for people this, who may be attending one of these events for the first time. As uh, Nipa mentioned, for the last 10 years, I've had the honor of uh, heading a small agency in the US government with that odd tobacco sounding acronym, SIGAR, but we're SIGAR with an S, not a C the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. As one of over 70 independent inspectors general in the US federal government, it is my mission and the mission of CIGAR's over 150 staff to identify waste, fraud, and abuse in government projects and recommend ways to, ways to improve government efficiency. The reason Congress ultimately created CIGAR was because of dollars and cents. 
To date, the U.S. government has appropriated over $145 billion, uh, U.S., that is, for Afghanistan reconstruction since 2001. That amount includes humanitarian aid, but does not include the greater amount, which is what the U.S. spent on war fighting which the Department of Defense estimates to be over $840 billion. Over the past 13 years, SIGAR has issued over 700 audits and other reports making over 1,200 recommendations to federal agencies to recover funds, improve agency operations, and increase program effectiveness, saving the U.S. taxpayer approximately $2.3 billion. In addition, as NEPA alluded to, criminal investigations have resulted in over 160 criminal convictions and over $1.6 billion in recoveries from fines and other restitution. So overall, our work to date has resulted in approximately $4 billion returned to the US taxpayer in savings and recoveries. Well, lastly, I wanna add something unique about SIGAR is that we are the only inspector general of the 70 inspectors general who have a dedicated lessons learned program. We have issued 11 extensive reports on topics useful not only in Afghanistan, but anywhere else in the world reconstruction or humanitarian work occurs in a post-conflict environment. So these reports could actually be useful in Ukraine when rehabilitation and development aid is, goes into that country once the shooting stops, which we hope happens soon. As Canadians, you may be thinking, well, that's all well and good, Mr. Sopko, uh, but that's only if you're an American. Why should I as a Canadian care? Uh, that's an excellent question. As the cigar, my focus has primarily been on the United States, but I am required by law to look at international cooperation and international best practices regarding financial assistance to Afghanistan. Like the United States, Canada has invested heavily in Afghanistan. In the last 20 years, Canada provided over $3.6 billion Canadian in stabilization, development, and humanitarian assistance. Over 40,000 members of the Canadian Armed Services uh, served in Afghanistan. Nearly 1,900 were wounded and over 159 men and women gave their lives in the service in, in Afghanistan. More recently, the Canadian government has announced $143 million Canadian in assistance for Afghanistan in 2022. Now, our respective government's financial generosity is in response to the humanitarian and economic calamity that now has befallen Afghanistan since the Taliban took over. According to the United Nations, over 24 million Afghans, which is approximately 59% of their population, require life-saving assistance this year. A number, that number has increased by 30% since last year. And that includes 23 million Afghans facing acute hunger. The UN also reports that Afghanistan's gross domestic product has contracted by 32%, that the cost of basic household goods has increased by 40%, wages have sharply declined if paid at all, and food now accounts for 80% of the average household budget. Why has this happened? It is true that a major drought reportedly the worst in 30 years, has affected three quarters of the Afghanistan's provinces. But the withdrawal of foreign development assistance and the cratering of Afghan's banking system are also at, also culpable, I should say. Prior to August, contributions from the international donors financed approximately 80%, 8-0, 80% of Afghanistan's public expenditures and kept the economy running. But when the Taliban marched out or marched into Kabul, I should say, foreign assistance marched out. What SIGAR has been warning and what everyone knew 
uh, to be the case became quite evident. Afghanistan was not financially sustainable, nor has it ever been financially sustainable without massive donor assistance. As I previously mentioned last week, the UN, along with the United Kingdom, Germany, and Qatar, sponsored a pledging conference with a goal of raising $4.4 billion in humanitarian assistance. That was the largest appeal for any single country in the history of the UN. Ultimately, only 2.4 billion was pledged, including 512 million from the US government and nearly 113 million from the Canadian government. The call for 4.4 billion was on top of $1.67 billion contributed in 2021 for humanitarian assistance, far exceeding the levels of prior years. Additionally, the United Nations has announced a separate appeal for an additional $3.6 billion to focus on sustaining health and education services and maintaining basic uh, infrastructure and service delivery with a specific emphasis on the needs of women and girls. The World Bank, for its part, has been de debating what to do with the funds remaining in the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund, ARTF. 34 countries donated a total of more than $13 billion to ARTF since 2002, which provided the largest share of international contributions to the Afghan government's budget. The U.S. contributing $4.1 billion and Canada contributing about $890 million. Now, the World Bank, like all of international organizations, ceased disbursements and operations when the Taliban took over. However, in recognition of Afghanistan's humanitarian challenges, the ARTF donors authorized the World Bank to transfer $280 million in ARTF funds to the World Food Program and to UNICEF to help the Afghans. Last month, the World Bank announced it intended to provide $1 billion more of ARTF's remaining funds to the UN agencies and international NGOs to, quote, support the delivery of essential basic services, protect, protect vulnerable Afghans, help preserve human capital and key economic and social services, and reduce the need for humanitarian assistance in the future. Now, $600 million of that, which had been allocated for the education sector, has been placed on hold uh, following the Taliban's recent decision to bar Afghan girls from any secondary schools. Now, the reason I mentioned that, because when you combine this with a possible $3.5 billion that may eventually become available from Afghanistan's frozen assets in the United States, there could potentially be over $10 billion in new assistance to Afghanistan in this year and in the coming years. Now that is a lot of money, but putting it in context, the US only spent 4.4 billion over the last 20 years in Afghanistan for humanitarian assistance. Now, continued funding to a Taliban-led Afghanistan at a time when there is a major war in the Ukraine is anything but certain. Nevertheless, I and my colleagues at SIGAR fear we have seen this movie before and it did not have a good ending. And that is the impulse by donors, the best impulse by donors to spend money, unfortunately to spend too much money, too quickly in a country with too small an economy to absorb and with too little oversight. For 20 years, we tried that in Afghanistan and that approach did not prevent the collapse of the Afghan state. And it is my hope and the hope of my colleagues that the donor community has learned some lessons from that experience in Afghanistan so that any future humanitarian assistance will actually help the Afghan people and not be diverted or otherwise wasted. Recall again, 
from October 2001 to August 2021, the US spent $145 billion on reconstruction in Afghanistan. During that time, the US and many other government agencies had constant presence on the ground. The eyes and ears of the donor community were virtually everywhere. There was constant communications between them and the palace, the presidential palace and Afghan government, where we had many technical advisors embedded. For example, at one point in time, SIGR had over 50 staff stationed around Afghanistan. Yet even with that level of international presence on the ground, SIGAR estimated, and we gave our best estimate, that approximately 30% of all US assistance uh, between 2009 and 2019 was lost to waste, fraud, or abuse. So consider the current situation in Afghanistan. No country has recognized the Taliban regime as the legitimate government. Many of their leaders are sanctioned as terrorists and donor, donors worldwide are at pains to declare that the assistance cannot and will not benefit the Taliban. Moreover, donor governments have few, if any, personnel on the ground. The risk, we argue, of waste, fraud, and abuse and the possibility of assistance really benefiting the Taliban are obviously now gr significantly greater than they were even eight months ago in August. I would argue that if assistance is to be provided, then it must be done with an eyes wide open and that there should be no illusion by anyone that its provision will be or can ever possibly be risk-free. But that it doesn't mean there shouldn't be strict oversight. In an effort to leverage SIGAR's 13 years of experience and apply it to the current situation, we developed 10 best practices to help donors provide taxpayer funds without risking the loss of those monies. I will spare you the recitation of all 10. They can be found on our website, www.sigar.mil or in our quarterly report, which was published in January uh, 30th of this year. I just want to discuss a few that may be of particular relevance uh, going forward. First, it is critical that any organization receiving donor funding is fully transparent so that the donors, whether they're Canadian Parliament or the US Congress, know where the money went and how it was used. It is becoming clearer with every passing day that much of the international assistance in Afghanistan will be channeled through a handful of a few multilateral organizations, particularly the UN. Donors must make it clear that the provision and amount of assistance provided to organizations like the UN, World Food Program, International Red Cross, and their partners be conditioned on access by the donors and their independent oversight agencies like SIGAR to their books of account, vetting procedures, monitoring and evaluation protocols, and any other safeguards against corruption and diversion. Unfortunately, our experience over the last 13 years is that monitoring, evaluation, and oversight of projects is easier said than done. We have previously expressed serious concerns about the level of oversight that the UN Development Program or UNDP was conducting over the Law and Order Trust Fund for Afghanistan or LATFA. The head of the UNDP at that time intimated to our auditors that the UNDP was not obligated to undertake full oversight of these funds. In addition, and I can say this from experience, the UNDP was not very helpful in assisting SIGAR in conducting its own oversight audit, despite significant US contributions to that fund. Now, SIGAR has had similar difficulties in the past with other organizations, including the World Bank, in gaining access to books and records. On a positive note, I will say, and the Canadians should be very happy about this, Canada's own 
Deborah Lyons, who used to be the Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan for, I believe, three years. I remember working with her very closely. She has now been appointed the current UN Secretary General's Special Representative for Afghanistan and is the head of UNAMA. Uh, she has proactively, since her appointment, reached out to SIGAR uh, to coordinate efforts to seek our counsel on best practices to protect donor funds and to utilize SIGAR's partner vetting capabilities. I've spoken to her and her senior staff on a number of occasions since August and really feel confident that she offers that breath of fresh air when it comes to real oversight and transparency. Now, we'll see how that develops going forward. It is going to be difficult for her, and I think she even admits that, that this is going to be a very difficult time. But at least you have somebody who's ready, willing, and able uh, to provide that transparency and oversight to the United Nations. Let me turn to the next, next best practice, and that has to deal with a, an issue called third-party monitoring. It's something that's necessary, but donors need to be diligent in carrying it out and in monitoring it itself. Aid providers like the UN and the World Bank have long used third-party monitors. This is bringing you somebody else comes in to take a look at their programs, to report on programs in, uh, in aid recipient nations. There's nothing inherently wrong with third-party monitors. Everybody uses them. SIGAR uh, itself used it for a number of years in Afghanistan, particularly because third-party monitors, we used Afghans themselves, we, we trained, were, it was easier for them to get around the country and a lot safer for them than to have send in US auditors. But donors and agencies, including SIGAR, must assure the accuracy and effective use of third-party monitoring and particularly their reports. SIGAR recently issued an evaluation of how the World Bank managed ARTF's a third party monitoring. It was a follow up to an audit we did in 2018. It actually was our, one of our last audits conducted and finished before the Taliban takeover. We just issued that report. And while the World Bank responded to some of our recommendations from 2018, there were still lingering problems with the World Bank's use of third party monitoring. Most critically, our auditors found that while the World Bank took some steps to address our recommendations to conduct performance evaluations and independent performance reviews of its third-party monitors, the completion of those independent reviews were infrequent and not very useful for donors. One donor said, told SIGAR that the World Bank focused more on project implementation, which means spend the money, then on project monitoring, which means watch how you spend the money. In the 10 years I have served in SIGAR, I have felt that third party monitoring and oversight in general, but particularly third party monitoring, has usually been an afterthought. A program is proposed, it's developed, it's funded, and then someone asks the question about oversight. And usually then they announce, well, we're going to do third party monitoring. What we're saying is the UN, USAID, and other donors must hire monitors who know what they're doing, allow them to do independent oversight, and then verify those reports and verify that those reports are actually used and not just shelved away in some library. And they got to also make certain that the, what those third party monitors do is transparent with those records, the actual audit records available to donors and independent oversight like, like SIGAR if requested. This is really important now, since many donors in the past appeared really content to fundle their assistance through the UN or the World Bank and then wash their hands of the difficult business of conducting effective oversight and monitoring. This was especially a problem we noticed with USAID and the State Department. I warn you, this attitude creates a single point of failure. Effective monitoring and evaluation must be baked in to humanitarian assistance programs with adequate resources and personnel assigned to oversee the massive amounts of money. Remember, 
I told you before, $10 billion potentially to be spent in Afghanistan in the future on humanitarian aid. Now, this was a concern we had with ARTF. Donor representative, donors representative, donor representatives, excuse me, that our auditors interviewed felt the number of World Bank staff assigned was insufficient to manage those programs. Now, the World Bank wasn't the only one we've had problems with. It was also a problem that SIGAR documented with US contracting officers who were required to manage too much money with limited resources. The result then is they often focused on the amount they put on contract and not whether any of those contracts were actually useful. So this brings me to our third and final best practice that I hope the humanitarian community and the donors take uh, heed of. And that is to seek specific but smart opportunities to condition aid. All donors have priorities they want to advance in Afghanistan beyond providing the financial assistance. For many donors like Canada and the United States, protecting the rights of Afghan women and girls has been a longstanding policy goal. The Taliban's return to power has caused great concern about the future of gender equality, which is one of the reasons why I think countries like Canada and the US are concerned. But even when the international donors were working with the prior Afghan government, SIGAR found imposing conditions on financial assistance generally failed. Why? Because the conditions lacked any credibility. Afghan officials cynically knew that the donors would never withhold assistance that the Afghan government said they desperately needed even if they didn't meet any of the conditions. Now, certainly the situation has changed a bit. There is no longer a recognized Afghan government to prop up and not to embarrass. Yet will donors be willing to withhold desperately needed assistance to pressure the Taliban to live up to their human rights obligations? Now, the first test to the donors has already occurred, I believe. On March 23rd, the Taliban banned Afghan girls from secondary, secondary schools. And it was really tragic. Many of the girls actually were attending the school, their first classes since August, and they had to be pulled back out of the schools by the Taliban. That decision resulted in a wave of condemnation, including joint rebuke from nine foreign ministers that included the United States and Canada. Additionally, the US canceled a meeting with Taliban representatives in Doha that was scheduled shortly thereafter. Uh, reportedly, uh, th this meeting was scheduled to look at the critical economic issues, including the independence of an Afghan central bank and the printing of Afghan money. Since currency shortages have been a driver of Afghan inflation, one wonders whether the Taliban regretted their decision about girls' education uh, when that plane that was going to be sent to, the, to Kabul uh, to go back to Doha with them never showed up. One State Department spokesman stated that, quote, the U.S. has made clear that we see this decision as a potential turning point on our engagement. Now, matters didn't really improve much afterwards, when just days afterwards, the State Department was, was forced to express, quote, alarm and deep concern, unquote, over the Taliban's decision to prevent broadcasters from airing international news programs. So Taliban decisions making regarding the operations of Afghan Central Bank also have raised concerns um, with the State Department and also with SIGAR. Many including the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan, have argued that sustainable improvement in Afghanistan's economy requires a recapitalized Afghan central bank. Now, these same officials say that there's a need for that recapitalized bank to operate independent from the Taliban and to be run by uh, Afghan technocrats and to be overseen by a third party, an independent auditing agency of some kind. However, the Taliban's choice 
of the number two person at their own central bank uh, has caused some concern. He's a former Taliban military leader sanctioned by the United States as a global terrorist. Uh, even if the Taliban didn't so blatantly flaunt donor demands, the strict controls the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan suggested for the central bank have been tried before and have failed miserably. Do we all recall the collapse of the Kabul Bank? That was another situation. It was the largest collapse of a bank in the history of the, of the world, I believe. That occurred decades ago in 2011. And that was a situation where, again, it was mainly US and donor money. Afghan, quote unquote, technocrats were running it, not the government and an outside auditing firm was sitting in the bank to monitor it. Nevertheless, the money in that case was stolen by many Afghan officials and their cronies. If a similar process is not done or is done the same way without really strict oversight, we may see the same problem, but this time the money will not be going to corrupt uh, cronies it will be going to the Taliban and their friends. So the question remains whether international donors will continue to have both the will to impose conditions on financial assistance to Afghanistan and the capacity to target those conditions so that they do not harm Afghan people. How this situation is resolved will educate the Taliban on just how seriously they need to take donor pressure and conversely, inform donors about how willing the Taliban will be to acquiesce to our concerns. So in conclusion, in the often tragic history of Afghanistan, August 15th marked yet another turning point. On that day, the Taliban discovered that governing a country is far more difficult than winning a war. Despite the Taliban's resumption of power, we all recognize there's a great desire by the Western donor community to ensure that the Afghan people receive necessary assistance to survive the current calamity. Significant financial assistance is likely needed, but much too much will be lost to waste, fraud, and abuse and end up in bolstering Taliban pocketbooks if donors fail to prioritize oversight. Are we in the West so naive that we think the Taliban are somehow miraculously immune from avarice and the temptations of corruption and therefore do not need to be strictly monitored when we talk about humanitarian assistance? Will such oversight that is needed be more difficult than it was prior to August, last August? Undoubtedly, yes. But will it be impossible? I say no. International donors should have learned some lessons from their experience in Afghanistan, as well as providing financial assistance in countries with unpalatable political circumstances around the world. But the question I leave with you is whether there will be a will to insist on oversight and the courage to pull the plug if funding is seriously compromised. So let me conclude with the penultimate lesson I have learned from my 10 years in Afghanistan. Namely, even if you have the best of intentions, Beware of spending too much money too fast with too little oversight. To do so now could actually be the cruelest joke we play on the Afghan people as they face their current situation. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the rest of the presentations and the questions. Thank you for your excellent presentation, as usual. I'm sure that there are lots of questions um, with the audience. Uh, 
but um, uh, we will reserve those questions uh, uh, after until after Daryl Copeland um, uh, joins in a dialogue with John, uh, and he will then facilitate the Q and A and comment session. Um, uh, so um, I will now go to um, introduce Daryl um, a little bit. Um, uh, former Canadian diplomat Daryl Copeland is an educator, analyst, and consultant, a research fellow at the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and a policy fellow at the University of Montreal's Centre for International Studies, Syrium. He was senior advisor, science diplomacy at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna from 2017 to 2018. He has recently completed terms as visiting professor at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna and the Academy of Diplomacy and International Governance in UK. Uh, the author of Guerrilla Diplomacy, Rethinking International Relations. Mr. Copeland has also written 12 scholarly book chapters and has produced some 200 articles in the popular and academic press. Accepting my invitation to join today's session as a discussant, Daryl made an interesting disclosure. I quote him, just in case anyone might be unaware, I was personally, professionally, and publicly opposed to Canada's misadventure in Afghanistan from beginning to the end. I continue to see it as a festering sore on the body politic, which many of those most directly implicated would far rather forget. I remember Daryl not joining the team of Canadians cheerleading the Afghanistan mission. Daryl, please join us now and I uh, invite you to join in a conversation with John. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Nipa, for that uh, very kind introduction. And John, um, I I've got to say, um, I, I just I, I find your your remarks um, really refreshing. Um, it's a cultural difference between Canada and the U.S. We've never had anyone in a position of like yours here, who is you know, is a presidential appointee and given full reign to be uh, as critical and analytical um, as, as may be seen to be required. And um, uh, so I, I just, I, I wanna salute you. I, I, the, the work that you've done uh, is, is really admirable. And, uh, and I've gotta say, uh, <clears throat> the material that was published in the Afghanistan papers by the Washington Post, which I understand was, uh, of Seagar origin, um, you know, was just again invaluable um, in, in casting light in the dark corners uh, of, of public policy and, and governance, uh, equivalent in some way to Ellsberg and, and the Pentagon Papers. Um, so um, I, anyway, uh, I'm a fan and uh, um, I thought you're, your presentation today was, was really good. Your 10 points, um, I'm sure that this won't come as any uh, uh, great revelation to you, but they're, they're, in, in, they're in many respects generic um, and kind of universally uh, applicable. I, I was in Ethiopia during the, uh, during the famine and the civil war, uh, working as political officer, monitoring um, uh, aid, it was mainly food aid, and uh, many of these excesses and uh, diversions and uh, and un unlawful uh, practices were were going on all the time. And as I was reading through your 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 best practices, I was just thinking, you know, those are exactly the points that I would have uh, wished to apply um, in in that sort of a setting. So just sort of laying them out like that. 
uh, I think that you've you you've done you've done a great service because they sure they apply and, and have been based on your ten years of experience in Afghanistan, but in fact, I think their um, their applicability is, uh, is is quite a bit broader. So I just wanted to thank you for that. And, and I want to thank uh, NEPA and uh, the folks at uh, the Center for International Policy Studies for, for putting this together. There's, there's a few of us here in Canada, and it's not many, um, who have been fighting against the, um, the tendency of the government uh, and the media to just basically walk away from um, our 15 year almost uh, engagement in Afghanistan. And, um, and, and I think that's, that's highly irresponsible. Um, and in, in that context, what I'd like to do is um, set out five uh, propositions and then five questions, which I hope will help seed uh, our discussion, our bilateral discussion, as well as the comments uh, from uh, from our audience, and uh, look, I, I I make no apologies for uh, anything that that I'm going to say. These these are my considered views. Uh, they um, they may not go down well in all quarters. Certainly, when I was uh, working in Canada's foreign ministry, starting in 2005, I tried to lead an ultimately unsuccessful rearguard action to get some analytical, uh, analytical attention directed to the decision to move from uh, working in Kabul under UN auspices to uh, basically joining Operation Enduring Freedom to uh, take on counterinsurgency in Kandahar. And, uh, and my, uh, my, my intervention was, uh, was uh, high, highly unwelcome uh, at all levels, but, but that didn't stop me. Anyway, under the rubric of a heading, something like blowback Afghanistan, counting the costs, colon, looking back, looking forward, and looking for lessons learned. Let me give you my five uh, propositions and, and five questions. The first, and, and, and I, this is going to kind of, I think, sort of blow the sides off. Um, uh, the particulars that you presented in your report, and I told NEPA this at the beginning, I, I want to try and broaden the conversation because I think that in Canada we, we really need this, so I'm not apologizing for that, but I, but I do just want to flag it. The first uh, proposition is that, in my view, the U.S. and NATO Canada stumbled blind and brain dead into the graveyard of empires. And after the late Robert Fisk, one of my uh, favorite British authors, authors, who said, the only thing we ever learn is that we never learn. So that's point one. Point two is there are no military solutions to the complex problems and challenges of the 21st century. And that, you know, that, that applies to Afghanistan, to, to Iraq, to Libya. But, but, but more broadly as well. And I can expand on all of these points if it's required. I, I could talk for days about each one. The third one, official development assistance, uh, in, in my observation, my view, in whatever form or context, can be highly corrosive for both the recipients and the donors. The fourth uh, point here, is that the 3D approach to engagement abroad, and this was highly trumpeted here in Canada during the Afghanistan uh, period, uh, wedding development, uh, defense and diplomacy supposedly together, sort of like a smart power Hillary Clinton sort of approach, um, in fact amounts to much less than the sum of its parts. And my fifth point is that Unless the stranglehold over international policy making and resource allocation, long exercised by the military, industrial, congressional, think tank, entertainment, media, lobbyist complex, 
can be broken somehow, um, then I, I, I can't be very optimistic about the prospects for, for progress. So th that's my five propositions. Um, I don't know if we should, should pause here and, and, and get your comments or if we should just go on to the five questions. What would you like? John, shall we, shall we pause here uh, and you can give me some feedback or shall I just roll into the questions? Uh, you know, uh, I, I defer to Nipa on this, but I think, why don't we go to the five questions? I think, I think that'd be probably better. Okay. Respond and then have more of a dialogue between the people asking questions and myself, yeah. Okay. Um, so um, shall we open the... Uh, Q and A and comments, the discussion session now, and I request the uh, audience who want to comment or ask questions um, to put them down in writing. It's easier, um, and then also if they are directed to one particular person, uh, Daryl or John, um, then um, uh, you can. Then you should do that. It's easier again to attend to the questions. Um, uh, but uh, Daryl Copeland will be facilitating this session. So uh, please go ahead and I request, you know, that there are, this is a very rich conversation that we, that we had from both. And um, let's see what you got out of it and what we can do with it for the future. Nipa, uh, perhaps, um, while we're waiting for uh, those questions to, uh, to turn up in the chat room, as uh, John suggested, I'll just uh, roll through my, my five questions that they kind of correlate to the five propositions in, in a direct way. Okay, and, and uh, may I request the audience to take, take note of these if you have questions on them. Thanks. Um, so my first uh, question is, after the key strategic objectives had been achieved in Afghanistan by early 2002, and by this I mean um, the closing down of the uh, Al-Qaeda training camps and the uh, uh, elimination of the Taliban government, uh, why was the focus then not shifted to reconstruction, economic assistance, and the promotion of human rights and democratic development rather than military occupation and counterinsurgency? That's question one. Question two is, given the enormity of the West's failure uh, in Afghanistan and the extraordinarily high costs in terms of uh, blood and treasure, why have participant governments not conducted the sort of searching comprehensive reviews which might allow them to learn from their own mistakes? I, I've seen absolutely none of that. Certainly here in Canada, there's been there's been nothing like that. Third point, and this this really has to do with with governance. Why have none of the people in key decision making positions been held accountable or responsible for their own actions, which resulted in the failure in Afghanistan? The fourth point. The Afghan people, the US and NATO countries were clearly losers in the wake of two decades of conflict. But have there been any winners? It's a very interesting uh, analytical question. And my last question is, where to now with Afghanistan? And this brings us back to John's presentation. Nipa, do you want me to respond to some of these, or wait for questions, or uh... Uh, you want to uh, you want to respond to this okay. in any way or comment? Sure. Uh, let, let, first, yeah. Let, let me just comment before you know we open the floor. I, first of all, I think all of these are good questions. Uh, we've asked some of them ourselves in our uh, uh, reports, and uh, in particularly. On the actually, it was issued the day of the fall of Kabul. Uh, we issued a report called, uh, and I'm just going to go over here and pull it.
what we need to learn, lessons from 20 years of Afghan reconstruction. And I don't say they, they uh, answer all your questions, uh, Daryl, but they raise a lot of those, uh, particularly about uh, uh, the mission and uh, uh, the strategy changing. And uh, I, 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 we don't say they walk blindly. We said that we, we didn't understand the country we were walking into. So we, we've been hitting those uh, issues. So I think these are all good questions. Um, I, we did not pose some of them because we don't do policy. We're an inspector general. We look at process more, but we're saying how the process did impact or poor processes did impact on the policy. But the one issue I have raised and you know I continue to raise is uh, accountability. Uh, if you don't hold anybody accountable for failure, then why do you give them rewards when they succeed? I mean, you have to do both. And I, I joke about the only person who probably will get fired uh, in, in about Afghanistan will be me. Uh, you always <laughs> shoot the messenger. And a number of people on the Hill and off the Hill have tried to do that. And fortunately, we've gotten a lot of support from uh, uh, Congress uh, and the American people for what we've exposed. But these are all very good questions. Um, I can say one thing is that Congress has asked us, and uh, I, I, again, these are people who have been reading our reports, and they've asked us to answer at least some of those questions you've raised. One is why did the Afghan government collapse? And that subsumes a lot of the points you're making. This, and, and that report will be coming out uh, probably in, by July, uh, we will do that. The second one was why did the Afghan military collapse so suddenly? And we will be issuing our preliminary findings on that uh, probably next month. And I think that should answer some of the questions you raise. And uh, then we'll be issued the final report toward July. Uh, Congress has also asked us what happened to all the money? And uh, we'll be issuing a, a preliminary report on that over the next month. And uh, I don't wanna steal the thunder and they're not done yet. And I don't wanna impose my thoughts on it, but I think those reports would, would, should be interesting. Uh, I really do think uh, we need more than SIGAR looking at this. And I, I think, and I know, uh, you know, the CIP, you're, 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 you're under NEPA, your organization has done some work on this, I think for some of the Western donors. I don't think for Canada, but I know, I think, I think it was either Germany or one of the Nordic countries asked some of your professors to look at some of these issues and do an analysis on all of the reports. Cause I know they came to us and asked us to give a, a, a background on all of the reports to look at why things didn't work. And I think that's very important. And I really wish more countries, I agree with you, Daryl, more countries should be looking at it. But let me just throw this issue back to you. And this is a problem we face in the United States. I assume you face in Canada also. And this is one reason why I think cigar has been so successful. We are so stovepiped in our government approach to all of these problems. You know, you have probably a parliamentary committee that just looks at the military. You have another parliamentary committee that looks at uh, foreign affairs. You have a parliamentary committee that looks at intelligence. You don't have one that looks at all of them, you probably. If you do, thank goodness, Canada is a little far ahead of us. In the United States, we don't have that. And when you do something like this in Afghanistan, it's not only a whole of government, all these multiple government agencies. I think we counted over 50 or 60 US government agencies at one time operating in Afghanistan. Uh, but it was the whole of government, it was the whole of governments. Plus you had Canada, Norway, Sweden, we had you know 20 some countries playing. Plus you had the World Bank, the UN, the Asian Development Bank. I could just keep going on and on and on. No one has, no one sits down and has authority to look at all of those organizations. We did at SIGAR to some extent because Congress when they created us never housed us in any 
government agency. You know, uh, I used to joke, I report the one person only, and that person never wants to talk to me. And that's the president of the United States. So we had the ability to look at any U.S. dollars spent by any U.S. government agency, whether it was NATO, uh, the, you know, money spent to the World Bank or UN. But most governments don't have that opportunity. And I think that's our problem, because the whole of government problems are the problems that are really tricky. Uh, uh, I spent a lot of time in Maine, and I hear the term that they use up in Maine, wickedly difficult. The wickedly difficult problems we are facing today in Canada or the United States are whole of government problems. And the way our government is organized, it doesn't deal well with whole of government. There's too many cracks between. So I throw that out, and I'm sorry for speaking too long on Daryl. You, you've raised some great points, which I hope uh, the audience uh, digs into. Daryl. Um, yes. uh, Daryl, you, you want to take the questions. Uh, 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 to the audience, please have your questions directed to whoever you want to answer. And um, Daryl will facilitate the session. Well, we're um, uh, waiting for um, the audience to, uh, to, to weigh in, and I hope that they will. Oh, they have. I just want to mention that uh, the questions, we already have a, a number of questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. There oh, did. Yeah. So just you did not, like, you know, it says Q&A, there are nine um, comments or questions there already. Can you, can you look at them, Daryl? Yeah, I'm seeing them now. Okay. Okay, well, uh, the first one from an anonymous uh, attendee, um, as if the billions of dollars in the last 20 years did not end up in the hands of crooks, felons, thugs, etc. If not, why would we have two thirds of the population in poverty before the Taliban took over? And how do you explain that? Well, I'm gonna give that one to you, John. Well, I, I don't fully understand the question, but I think that what the questioner is getting at is uh, all the money was stolen, you figure it would go to the poor people. Well, no, when, when people steal money, it usually doesn't go. There's no Robin Hood uh, in Afghanistan who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. They were crooks. They were government officials, and you probably see their homes right now in, uh, in Ottawa, Toronto, Northern Virginia, uh, and Dubai. Um, that money was stolen, siphoned off, and used for ill-god gains. And uh, so, unfortunately, the poor are just as poor as they were before. Okay, let me go on to uh, the next one, which uh, is, um, is quoting some of your reports, or referring to some of your reports. <clears throat> the, um, the question is, in a recent tweet, Sigar quotes the Defense Intelligence Agency as saying, quote, former ANDSF, including special ops personnel, have almost certainly joined the National Resistance Front, end quotation marks. Can you elaborate? Is this US policy or an Afghan initiative supported by the US? And are some of these operatives trained, equipped, and transported by the US? That's their first question. The second is, how are the SIGAR audits and investigations of Ashraf Ghani and his entourage going, as they are alleged to have looted revenues and aid money from 2015 to 2021? Where are the billions that are missing or wasted? Okay. Well, they're, they're directed to me, so let me quickly say, I, uh, on the first one, I, I, I think we were just quoting DIA. I really don't have any more information on that. I, I don't know if there's a U.S. policy or not. I just think this is information that DIA was picking up somehow. So um, um, I don't know of any major resistance movement uh, in Afghanistan, but uh, um, that doesn't mean there isn't one. We just have not seen uh, reporting, major reporting on that. Um, 
As for the second question about uh, the allegations received in uh, uh, about Ashraf Ghani, we have received allegations about many former Afghan officials. We have followed up on that. Uh, again, it's easy to make allegations. It's, uh, it's more difficult to uh, uh, actually prove them. Uh, and as you well know, in Afghanistan, a lot of allegations are uh, uh, made uh, for political reasons and whatever. We will be reporting on our preliminary findings on this probably within a month. And uh, I'll wait till then to discuss in more detail. Uh, but again, let me just say, it's easy to make an allegation uh, and not always do those allegations are true. And uh, it's our job to look into these allegations and we will be reporting uh, at the appropriate moment, which will be in the next month or, one or so. Okay, um, another one for you. Um, what percentage of the 10 billion you referred to in your presentation do you suggest must be earmarked for oversight and then bracketed M&E? And what percentage do you think will likely be spent on administration slash oversight slash subcontracting slash security slash headquarters salaries, et cetera, so that we have some idea of what percentage will actually reach the people? You know, we've never broken down what percentage you should spend on oversight. Uh, actually, you know, we're pretty cheap in comparison to the money being that was spent in Afghanistan. Uh, I mean, uh, by cheap, I mean, uh, uh, we're not that expensive. So I can't really tell you. Uh, now, there's administrative and oversight, I mean, administrative costs. I mean, what you're talking about and, and this does add up, is that uh, let's assume you're transporting food. You gotta somehow get it in there. You gotta somehow distribute it. And so I would not be surprised that the percentage of money going for uh, administration and subcontracting, security and whatever, could be pretty high. Uh, and if you look at experience, and I know Daryl, you had experience, I think when you were working for in Canada, for Canada in Africa, there are expenses that you just can't avoid, particularly in a country where there, you know, there's not much infrastructure to start with. So what I'm saying, and one of the points we make is, you know, the donors up front should be very honest to their taxpayers saying, this is gonna cost money. We wanna help the Afghans or we wanna help Ethiopians or we wanna help whatever the people are, but it's gonna cost money. And I'm not so naive to think that some of the money is not gonna be diverted. As much as we put in these, this oversight mechanisms, we have to accept that. And I think in the past, our governments have not been as honest or as forthcoming as they should have been to their respective taxpayers, that there will be some loss to to matter what, but accept that beforehand. Say it, be honest to the taxpayers beforehand, not after the fact come in and say, oh, well, 30% or 50% is gonna be stolen. So I don't know, Daryl, I, I throw this back to you from your experience doing development assistance or humanitarian assistance in Africa, uh, if I'm accurate or not. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're right on the money um, on that, Sean. Um, but you know, it, it, it's always a tough call. You know, um, one, one wants to be uh, diligent and um, it, it's really important that uh, international humanitarian assistance be, be carefully tracked. And, you know, the big concern in Ethiopia was that the, the vast amount of food aid uh, that was flowing in to, to deal with the famine wasn't diverted to uh, the military uh, efforts in the civil war with, uh, with Eritrea. And so um, that was difficult, but, but there were, you know, there were very significant administrative overheads involved and, you know, you simply couldn't do the monitoring without incurring those overheads. So it's, it's, 
it's always a kind of slippery question. You, you obviously, you, you want to keep those overheads to a minimum, uh, but they can't be avoided. Yeah. Um, let me go to uh, let me go to the next question because they're really uh, coming in here. Okay, my question to the Cigar, while well, speaking about corruption in Afghanistan, most of the key governmental advisors involved in corruption of millions of dollars are currently living in the US. How are you dealing with those guys that hollowed out the foundations of, the, of Afghan institutions and left around 35 million Afghans at the mercy of terrorist Taliban? Specifically, I'm referring to Dr. M. Hamayun Kwayami and Dr. Sham Shad M. Sargand, advisors to President Ghani, and Dr. Mohib NSA, whatever that is, Afghanistan, et cetera. Well, well let, let me respond. I, I, you know, I'm not going to uh, talk about any specific individuals. Um, it is easy to make an allegation, and uh, um, we we will follow up on any allegation. We have a uh, uh, you go to our website. There's a hotline button. If you have specific information, uh, you know it, it, it's not a crime to have made a mistake, and it's not a crime to have made a lot of mistakes. That hasn't been criminalized yet, but. If somebody out there has specific information, and if they want to give it to us anonymously, they can. We protect our sources. Uh, please go to our website, hit that button, uh, which talks about uh, uh, the hotline. Um, and just so you know, I'm, Daryl, I'm going to allude to something you mentioned. You mentioned the Washington Post did a series of articles based upon some of our information. They FOIA'd the information, we gave it to them, maybe not as fast as I would have liked or as they had liked. But then, I don't know if you know this, the Washington Post then sued us. They sued us not to get more information, but to get the names of some of the people who talked to us who wanted to be anonymous, who were afraid of being either losing their job or uh, getting killed in Afghanistan, to be honest with you, a number of Afghans who talked to us. And we had promised them anonymity. And uh, I thought it was kind of ironic that the Washington Post, which, um, if I recall, there was a guy called Deep Throat, who they were protecting yes, yes. that person's name for about 20 or 30 years, would then ask us to give the names of our Deep Throats, uh, although none of them were you know, as important, but to them, they were important. And to us, they were important. We can't operate unless we can protect our whistleblowers or our anonymous sources. But anyway, so we went to court. It took for years, but we won. So I just want to tell people who may have information about fraud, waste, and abuse, who are afraid of their name coming out, we will protect your name and you, you as a source. So go to our website, contact us, and we will follow up. Uh, and that's how I'll answer this question. Uh, the next question is, any comment on the Biden administration's decision to steal Afghan people's money and then in brackets, the seven billion question? Well, I, 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 I won't agree with the, the, uh, uh, the verb, uh, the steal. I, I don't know. Uh, all the intricacies of that. That was money that was sitting uh, in, in our Federal Reserve. Uh, it's really complicated with a lawsuit going on by a number of people who are suing the Afghan government for their participation in or their culpability with uh, the 9-11 attack. And uh, so I, I we had no role in that decision. There was a decision to cut it in half and set aside half of it for the litigants and half of it for uh, potentially recapitalizing a, um, um, a central bank in Afghanistan. Uh, again, 
SIGAR wasn't asked to comment and we're not involved in the, the litigation. And, and a lot of this is going to be decided by a court. So I don't even know where that money is going to end up, to be honest. Mm -hmm. with you. But that's really a judicial decision. Our concern, as I raised in my presentation, is if you decide, and that's a policy decision, to recapitalize the central bank, you just got to be careful in how you do it. Uh, and how do you protect the money? Because, you know, just saying you're going to bring in uh, 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 Afghan technocrats to work on it and not bureaucrats from the government, and to say you're going to have an outside auditing firm overseeing it, we've seen that movie, it's, and it didn't have a good outcome. That was my reference to the Kabul Bank. And I know, Nipa, you're well aware of that. I remember when, we, uh, when I first came up, the Kabul Bank failed in 2011, I believe. The expose came out in 2012 about how many people in the government basically used the Kabul Bank uh, as uh, their piggy bank. And uh, most of that money was from w uh, Western donors. And the technocrats were well-trained, but they didn't do anything to protect it. And those that did try to raise allegations, these allegations were quashed. And uh, the outside auditing firm just sat there and gleefully accepted the money from uh, the, uh, uh, I think it was the US Treasury or it may have been the UN or somebody was paying their salaries and never reported all of their, uh, uh, all of their red flags that were going off. So all I'm just saying is we've seen this movie before, and if we're going to do it again, we're going to have to do it a little better. Otherwise, we're going to lose all that money to the Taliban now, and not just a bunch of corrupt uh, former uh, uh, government officials who worked in the Afghan government. Another one uh, for you, John. Um, when can we expect SIGAR's return to Afghanistan, and how is it planning to support NGOs? Uh, I don't expect SIGAR to return to Afghanistan, uh, except virtually uh, because of just the security situation anytime soon. And uh, because uh, as we are a US government agency and our government does not recognize the uh, current regime in Afghanistan, I don't know how we're gonna get in there. So there's a major security concern. We can still do a lot of our work remotely because we're you know, following up on contracts and we'll look at contracts. And that's why it's so important to get access to books and records, particularly if the UN or the World Bank are involved. And we, you know, we feel we have a right to look at it because 20% of the UN is US government taxpayer dollars. That funds the UN. Uh, and a good percentage of the money that was sent to ARTF and to the World Bank is US taxpayer dollars. So we feel we have a right to go in there. And of course, if we find any problems, we obviously will alert the other donors, which we did in the past. Uh, I remember briefing the Canadian government about what we found when we first looked at ARTF because the Canadians were concerned. I remember briefing the Germans and the uh, Nordic countries about that. Uh, likewise, with our concerns with LATFA, uh, we briefed all of the other donors on what we were finding. And, uh, uh, and I think that was very helpful. Okay, um, how about this? Why does the US not hold Pakistan accountable, especially after the death of Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad? Well, that really is out of my line of work. I don't do foreign policy. Uh, I look at reconstruction in Afghanistan. Uh, that's a, a good question, but I, I, I'm just not privy to answering it. Daryl, you may be able to answer it better than I can because of your foreign policy experience. Yeah, well, you know, my, my comment on that, I mean, the, the first observation is just that the, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the complexity of the relationship, the bilateral relationship between um, the US and Pakistan, you know, really right from, um, 
using Pakistan to uh, channel assistance to the Mujahideen in the uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, and the result being the uh, the successful ejection of the Russians. Um, but ironically, and this is where the whole blowback issue uh, arises, um, essentially ensuring that uh, that the Taliban would uh, would win the Afghan civil war, and <clears throat> that led to the the training bases for Al Qaeda, and uh, you know it really is a, a classic example of what political scientists like to refer to as blowback, and there's, there's probably really not, not a better one anywhere. It also um, raises um, the point that I um, tried to make in um, uh, one of my uh, questions, number four, you know, it's pretty clear that there have been a lot of losers um, over the last couple of decades in Afghanistan, not least the Afghan people, but have there been any winners? And, you know, on that, and that, that's a matter of uh, geopolitics and, and geoeconomics, but it would seem to me um, that China uh, has probably emerged as the, uh, the major uh, beneficiary of uh, the outcome that we've seen, um, mainly through um, their in increasingly uh, close ties with Pakistan through the Belt and Road Initiative. And, um, and I would expect Afghanistan will, will find its way uh, into some of that Chinese largesse as well. So another one of these uh, unintended consequences, but um, uh, holding Pakistan to account, um, uh, much easier said than done, just, just because of the, the enormous complexities involved. Next question for John. You spoke of conditionality of donor assistance. In your view, should this apply to life-saving humanitarian assistance or only non-life-saving development assistance? How can the Canadian government balance its obligation to provide life-saving assistance to Afghans with the need to influence Taliban behavior and extract concessions? You know, this is a a very good question, Ariel. You uh, uh, you hit the uh, nail uh, on the head here, and that is the dilemma I think uh, we all face. Uh, donors always face. Uh, on the one hand, you don't want to um, prevent humanitarian aid to go to starving, uh, dying. Uh, children and people in Afghanistan. But on the other hand, you don't want it to be diverted. I mean, and, and that's what we're talking about. You know, every donor who's donating money now will say, we, they, they say we're not going to put conditions on it, but they actually do because they say they want the money not to go to the Taliban. And what we're saying is, if that's a condition, we, you know, it, uh, uh, then let's let's talk about it. How do we do that? How do we protect that money? Every donor, and, and Daryl, you'll, you'll you'll remember your work in Africa to go back to your experiences. Every donor said, "Look, we wanted the money. It, the the taxpayers gave the money to the Canadians to give to people who were starving in Ethiopia or needed medical aid. They didn't give it." to the Canadian foreign ministry or foreign affairs uh, office to give it to a, an Ethiopian warlord so he could buy more guns. So you did put conditions on it, even though the government and the UN, I, some high level UN official, maybe the secretary general says that we're giving all the humanitarian aid and putting no conditions. You are putting conditions. You don't wanna see it wasted. Otherwise, if it's you don't care about it getting wasted, why not just burn it for all you care? So what we're saying is you are going to put conditions on, basically to make certain it gets to the intended, it accomplishes the intended purpose. So how do you put those conditions? At, at rather than political conditions. Now there's a whole other question and that is, can you condition aid on saying, okay, we're not going to give money 
the starving children in Afghanistan if you don't let girls go to school. Now that's a more of a political condition. And I, I, that I think is what the questioner is looking at. And that's really a policy decision. And I, I'm gonna I'd say, I, that's a tough one. And, and Daryl, I think Daryl and Nipa, this is something that I think maybe based upon your years of experience, how do you do that? How do you distinguish those type of conditions which are operational conditions I'm talking about to make certain the money gets to the people you want it to get to versus putting these political. And I'm gonna throw back to you, Daryl and Nipa, because I think you've been ex had experience with this a lot more than I did. How do you do that? And, and I, I, I didn't mean to dodge this one, but I think we need to have this discussion. I think this questioner has a good question here. But my short answer, and it's a very short answer, is <clears throat> with great difficulty. But um, but that's not uh, an excuse for a best efforts approach to ensure that there's uh, no diversion. And uh, hence all of your comments about the importance of uh, monitoring and evaluation. I mean, it's it's absolutely critical, but it but it's also very very tough, especially in the field where you know, you're confronted with circumstances that are just, it, it, it makes the, the operating environment um, very challenging. In my years in Ethiopia, with the rock stars trooping through and the midnight curfew, which meant that wherever you were at 11.45 was where you were going to be spending the night, and, um, you know, plane loads full of duty-free coming in from Germany and one, one life in Addis and then another life um, out in the field. It, it was kind of like working in a theme park for the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> That's a but, I'll tell, but, I'll, but I'll tell you, there, there was never a dull moment. Yeah. Nipa, do you have a comment on that? Well, you know, I, I somewhat agree with you. It's very difficult. You know, recently I wrote a, it's conditioning aid to some extent, but if it is for humanitarian assistance, starving children, et cetera, I would say that humanitarian assistance should be given uh, from ethical point of view, it should be given uh, without conditions. And of course, not for diversion. I mean, that's, that's something that you have to ensure that it is getting to the people who need it. Um, uh, if that is, okay, I mean, that, that, that's a condition for any kind of assistance. Um, but, um, you know, uh, tying, tying of women's rights to aid, uh, to humanitarian assistance, that is that you have to give, um, uh, you have to have the people, uh, the um, uh, women uh, attend secondary schools. They will be open for, um, uh, secondary schools will be open for women and girls. Um, to tie that, to provision of humanitarian assistance for starving children, I would find it difficult. I can't, I can't accept that. Um, uh, yes, women have their rights. It is very important. However, whether or not it's more important than children, than saving children dying out, out of starvation is an issue that you need to you need to look at. I have an ethical dilemma with that. Um, uh, uh, with other kinds of aid, it's okay, but not for humanitarian assistance. And, and can can I add to what Nipa and Daryl, what you're saying? And I think this is a situation where I think it, it, I can say something positive about what the donor community has done. And many people say I never say anything positive about what the donor community does. But in this case, I think they do draw a distinction. If you noticed uh, when the Taliban refused to allow girls into secondary school, the reaction of the State Department and our State Department, I think made a distinction here. They didn't stop funding uh, humanitarian aid, you know, and trying to feed the kids. They, basically said, oh, you want to meet about uh, restructuring your banking system? No, off the table now. So it didn't directly impact, you know, somebody getting some food uh, the next day. But uh, they did say there's a cost about this. Um, the World Bank, 
was actually giving money from ARTF to fund salaries of the Ministry of Education. And they immediately put that on pause. They said, okay, you playing around with not teaching girls, we're not gonna give it. So they made that distinction. And I think that's a good distinction. And this is why if you go to, you know, our recommendations uh, that came out in, the, uh, in January, our 10, 10 best practices, one was you gotta have somebody in charge and somebody in charge in the field, because as you realize, Daryl, when you were in Ethiopia, you know, one province may be actually allowing the warlords there were allowing the food to get to the starving kids. Another province may have been diverting. You want to have the ability on the ground that somebody can make a decision and say, okay, we're going to keep funding that province, but we're not going to fund that province. And oh, warlord, this is the reason why we're not doing it. And right now, this is the concern we have to some extent is even though there's a limited number of agencies, you know there's about 11 or 12 or 13 separate UN agencies operating in Afghanistan. And there is nobody in charge, as far as we can tell. You have Ambassador Lyons, who I praised as one of the best ambassadors I've ever dealt with. And, but she is the UNAMA, head of UNAMA. She is the, secure, the uh, uh, Secretary General's senior official, but she has no operational control on any of those agencies. That to me is going to cause a problem because there's nobody in charge. So you need somebody on the ground to make quick decisions and call up the Taliban and says, hey, we hear there's problems up in uh, Kandahar. We're going to stop funding. But you don't have that now. Maybe a year after the fact, somebody will report back that they're diverting funds. So you need that flexibility. And I don't know, Daryl, you had that when you were in Africa. But uh, you know, did, was there somebody in charge of the Canadian assistance who could say, we're going to stop funding? And, and that is a way to get real conditionality working. Yeah, well, <clears throat> as you well know, the, um, the political bureaucratic uh, interface um, in the headquarters city, um, and so in our case, uh, Ottawa, combined with the um, highly stovepiped uh, activities of the various sections uh, in the embassy uh, made that kind of overall coordination um, and, and, and a more kind of strategic approach uh, re really, really difficult um, and, and almost impossible. And it was, it was not. It was complicated vastly by the fact that, um, and I mentioned the operating environment, I mean, you're in a sea of KGB and CIA agents. It's the end of the Cold War. There's secret police trainers from the Stasi. There's Polish pilots in, in, in biplanes that we're hiring to get into some of the more uh, remote regions to, to track the delivery of food aid. I mean, as I said, the, the, the short answer is it's, it's just, it's really difficult. Let me go to the next question. Uh, this is a really good one. Um, uh, uh, Daryl, uh, how many yeah. questions do you still have about 24? I see 24, but maybe yeah. some of them have been answered, uh, have been attended to. Yeah, well, we'll, 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 we'll skip over ones that to try and eliminate any uh, okay. repetition okay. in the 35 minutes that we've got left. Yeah. But this one is a really good one. Part of the failure, and I think what they mean is the the failure of NATO in the West to <clears throat> deliver on Afghanistan was due to the fact that donors did not understand the Afghan culture. And of course, this raises, you know, the whole graveyard of empires, my comment about stumbling blind and brain dead uh, into, uh, into an exceedingly complicated situation without the the historical and cultural background required to even begin to come to grips with stuff like uh, Pushtun Wali. And there, you know, there's been a lot written on this, but if anyone's interested, by far uh, my, my favorite 
uh, reference uh, to this. It was uh, published back in the spring of 2008 by the, uh, by the Belfry Center uh, at the Kennedy School. And it was uh, written by a, a couple of authors, Thomas Johnson and uh, Chris Masons. And it's called No Sign Until the First Burst of Fire. Just, just a superb piece about our, our, our serial inability to, to deal with complex uh, cultural environments where, where it's, it, it's so tough to operate uh, without that kind of historical and, 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 and cultural knowledge, you know, which has to be deep. But at the same time, you know, uh, People make careers out of crises. And so Afghanistan, I mean, not only was there this kind of willful blindness, but it was kind of a, it was a, it was a proving ground for the latest theories on counterinsurgency, three block war, war amongst the people, asymmetric warfare, fourth dimension war, um, uh, uh, human terrain engineering. I mean, it, there's there's just there's a there's a very sort of fundamental disjuncture there between the the western forces coming in wanting to try out their latest ideas not to mention their latest munitions and and the underlying situation that they about which they know almost nothing and uh, so i think that uh, apropos of the question you know part of the failure was due to the fact that the donors don't understand the Afghan culture well, absolutely. I don't know if you've got a thought on that, John. Well, I mean, I, I go back to our report that came out. I mean, that's one of the key findings is that, you know, the U.S. government didn't understand the Afghan context and therefore failed to tailor its efforts. So, but I, I'd love to hear what NEPA, because NEPA, you were there early on in Afghanistan with uh, the Canadian assistance uh, program. What, what did you feel? Similar problem? On this cultural understanding? Yes. Issue? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't think, I, I was there 2003 to 2006, very early years. Um, we, I did not see any discussions from anywhere, either the headquarters or at the embassy and amongst the donors, um, talking about understanding of the culture. There was, there was no, the, the, no questions were asked and no one discussed that. Um, and our first evaluation that came out, uh, that was in 2013, I think, you know, that had, um, that had said that there was no um, uh, there was no understanding of the culture, and that was one of the causes of um, causes. Of, I mean, it never said that the causes of failure, but that was one of the weaknesses. And then we had another in in two thousand nineteen. There was another evaluation done, and the same issue came up. So I would say Canada. I mean, I, I really don't know what happened uh, with the US, um, uh, but in Canada, there was, uh, there was no, uh, no interest in this cultural issue. And another thing I would say is that there was very little at the embassy level, or as I understand um, in Kandahar, there was very little communication between the people that we had there had in Afghanistan um, and the local people. You know, I mean, yes, you would have a meeting with President Karzai, but that doesn't really mean that you are, you are developing a network like that. And um, uh, so we, um, uh, I, I would say, that, and, and there was no communication and there was, they were not even allowed to go out too much to meet with people. There was very little travel done as well. I mean, I know that my previous colleagues in um, Global Affairs Canada wouldn't like it, but that was 
a major problem. Fortunately, you know, I, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, I guess they thought I could be spared. So I didn't have, <laughs> I didn't have armed guards with me all the time. And then I really could travel a huge amount, you know, um, in the villages. And I almost went to all the provinces. I've got very strong links and very strong friendships developed with, um, uh, with Afghans uh, at different levels, you know, at the lowest level as well as at higher levels. Um, however, I still don't say that I understand Afghan culture. It's a very complex culture and it's extremely difficult to understand. Only thing I would say that my travels and my, um, you know, uh, without guards traveling helped me to, uh, to uh, develop really links and relationships with Afghans. That helped me to um, undertake, you know, certain activities or do certain things um, because of my contacts. But um, other than that, I don't think it had any impact on the programming. Well, you know, I must say one thing that when the headquarters paid little attention, that is the usual case in all, like, you know, I worked in CEDA and I had nine postings and everywhere I had the same uh, experience. I mean, the headquarters have very little interest in, um, in taking up on a recommendation from the field, or I used to write every week um, um, memo to say what the update was in Afghanistan. I never got any questions back, nobody asked anything. And when we had the provincial reconstruction team in Kandahar, you know, what they did was to completely cut it off from that PRT. The provincial reconstruction team, team was cut off from the central Kabul government and also from the embassy. We did not know what the Kandahar team, what the PRT was doing. And um, so this was, the, this was the way. I mean, uh, Daryl can comment on uh, the kind of things that he had heard from the people who worked in the Kandahar team uh, that they did not, um, I mean, maybe Daryl should repeat that. You told me a few days ago um, as to what no, I was, said. Uh, that's exactly what was on my mind too, Nipa. So, um, you know, w w one of the great ideas uh, that I had, um, I think around uh, 20, 2006 or 2007 was to uh, go to Afghanistan and do a comparative analysis of how the various uh, NATO countries were organizing, managing, and, and operating their, their PRTs. And the, region, the reason that I wanted to do this was that I, I had interviewed a number of the political officers that were returning from Kandahar. And what they told me was that um, it was essentially impossible to do diplomacy. And this is apropos of my comment about this 3D approach, uh, wherein the the, um, the total amounts to well less than the sum of the parts. It wasn't a 3D mission. It was basically defense with a little bit of window dressing around uh, diplomacy and development. And so the political officers that would be sent to Kandahar, if they wanted to go out and uh, do some intelligence gathering or some, some interviews or, or just some observations, they had to go out with a squad of, of guys in, in, in body armor, um, with heavy weapons um, in, a, in, a, in an armored vehicle. And, you know, if you turn up in somebody's driveway, you want to have a conversation with. And a bunch of guys in, in all of this military garb, you know, pop out and secure the perimeter. Like, really, who, who's going to want to talk to you and, and about what? Um, so the, the impossibility of, of doing diplomacy, and, and that led to this observation that I just referred to, and it's kind of funny, but it was widely said that the political officers, because it was impossible to actually do diplomacy, <clears throat> tended to um, 
turn into um, lunks, punks, or drunks. Lunks because they spent the day um, watching videos because there was nothing else to do. Punks because they'd spend the day in the gym doing bodybuilding. And drunks because there was duty-free booze. And what do you do all day? Well, you just drink. And, and, and this, this, this then raises my, my question about the, the sort of the corrosive uh, effect of, of, of Western um, interventions in, in very complicated places like Afghanistan. It, it, in my observation, uh, very, very corrosive um, at both ends. Uh, what I saw at headquarters was uh, human and financial resources being devoted to a place that hadn't even been on the radar screen before 2001. And it became for almost a decade, our number one uh, foreign policy diplomacy development priority. And, uh, and it sucked resources uh, out of everywhere else in the foreign ministry resources which were needed to deliver other programs in, in other parts of the world. And it became sort of a ticket punching exercise for people, ambitious careerists who were uh, looking to get promoted because if you'd go and serve in Afghanistan, then you'd get your choice of postings, maybe Thailand or London or whatever you wanted afterwards. And, um, and so apparatchiks and, 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 and acolytes and sycophants uh, of which there's lots in bureaucracy anyway, uh, tended to thrive in this kind of environment. And uh, people with other ideas about uh, public administration and uh, more traditional values about how public administration should be, uh, should, should be managed and delivered um, were, were, were ignored or worse. So, um, and I'm, I, got, I got to give folks another reference on this one because it's my favorite. And some of you may have seen this, but if you haven't, uh, and, and it, again, these aren't new references, but, but they're really good. Back in 2014 in Rolling Stone, an article by uh, Matthew Akins called um, Last Tango in Kabul. And it's about the, uh, <clears throat> the consultant culture and uh, foreign currency and uh, restaurants and servants and uh, drivers and uh, green zone uh, type living and uh, very high salaries and uh, sucking all the talent out of the Afghan state because you can pay higher salaries. And uh, yeah, corrosion. It's, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing and, 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 and very difficult to remedy, very difficult to avoid. Um, um, any, any comments from uh, John? Uh, well, I mean, time is short. I mean, I could I could wax and wane poetically also about the skunks and the monks. So uh, you had that. Uh, I didn't know the Canadians had the same problem. The drunks, monks, uh, hunks, uh, hunks, hunks, yeah, hunks and whatever. I heard the same thing uh, ten years ago. But uh, I basically agree, and, and, and you know, it, it was a problem. I, I just hope uh, that other governments will take the time to do what you, Daryl, and I think Nipa, you've been talking about it for years, is to sit down and do the type of lessons learned reports uh, that the US government's doing. Uh, because I think each country spent a lot of money for every country that was there it was probably more money spent on any one country than ever before. I think the Canadians, the UK, the Germans, everybody. So you owe it to learn some lessons. And uh, in between the two of you, there are a lot of lessons. And, and I'm certain if you sat down with all the hundreds of uh, Canadian officials who served there and the thousands of soldiers who served there, you know, we should learn it. And, and let me just interrupt, and I'll, and I'll shut up, but I think it's really important. There is a tendency now to say, hold it, we're never going to do this again. You know, so, so ignore it. 
That's exactly what the United States said after Vietnam. We're never going to do that again. Well, we did it in Iraq. We did it in Afghanistan. There are nascent countries around the world where we're doing the same thing, uh, but it's smaller, but this is a slippery slope. So what I'm saying is you really do need to sit down, and I hope your country is listening to NEPA and listening to you, Daryl, and your parliament is, to try to sit down and, and do some lessons learned because you're going to do it again. You may be doing it in the Ukraine in another year. You know, you may be doing it somewhere else in Africa or Latin America. Uh, and uh, I, I, we are so foolish not to sit and think and do some real lessons learned. And uh, uh, I, I hope you all do it. <clears throat> well, we have uh, about I... 10 minutes left. Well, not really, you know, about, yeah, seven, eight minutes left. Do you want to continue with some, um, some questions you might have found which are very prior of priority nature, Daryl? Well, um, I, I've got to, yeah, there, there's one um, here about um, my accountability point and responsibility and why are uh, governments so loath to, uh, to pursue investigations involving uh, their own people. And, um, you know, we've got a, a particular case uh, in Canada, a great big piece of unfinished business, possibly involving the, uh, the Commission of War Crimes. And it has to do with uh, the Canadian treatment of Afghan detainees, where we were basically <clears throat> handing them over to the Afghan secret police and intelligence services with no oversight, no follow up, no anything. And uh, a political officer who uh, was in uh, the embassy at, uh, in Kabul at the time, a guy named Richard Colvin, um, a lawyer, um, pointed out that this practice was you know, contrary to international law and the laws of war. And uh, not only did people not want to hear uh, what he had to say, but they basically told him to shut up and die. And um, this then leads into my point about corrosion. Investigations were launched. Um, our parliament was prorogued uh, twice. So damage to democracy in order to uh, first interrupt the proceedings of the Military Police Complaints Commission who somehow got the file. And then an all party uh, house uh, committee in parliament that was looking at the documentation. And in the end, um, no one was held to account. And because in Canada, we had all party support for the Afghan effort. And in my view, there was just blood on, 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 on so many hands that uh, there's absolutely no uh, political appetite for the sort of uh, reflective searching, uh, the deeply investigative analysis, uh, which could lead us to hold uh, uh, the key people who made the decisions accountable for their decisions. And, you know, all I can say about that is that I, 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 just, I, I find it profoundly depressing. No, I will, I will uh, mention one thing, is that when you say there is no, polit no appetite, um, in the last evaluation, um, they call it independent evaluation, although it's an unit within Global Affairs Canada. But anyway, they came to me at first and they said that we want to talk to you um, uh, because we find that you have, you have written about things and spoken about things that, that we need to look at. Um, and uh, I said, okay, you can come. And, and they came several times over a course of um, about six months. They came to me several times uh, individually and with their team to talk to me about different things. And then there were email exchanges. Then at one point they said that like you have spent a lot of time for us and uh, we want to, um, uh, will you take us, a, take a contract from, from us? And I said that, look, you know, I really don't want to do that because I have my views. I don't want to 
uh, to be influenced by anyone as to what I would say in that kind in my conversations with you. Those are mine and they should be reflected in your reports. And then they said, oh yes, yes, no problem at all. They sent me a contract um, as well. And I looked at the contract. I wanted to talk to a lawyer because, um, uh, you know, I mean, it had kind of vague reference to what my obligations and responsibilities should, would be. And it seemed to me they were asking me not to, not to talk to anyone, anyone else uh, or not to say, like, you know, there was no directly very clear language, but it seemed to me indirectly, they were telling me that, oh, be careful, you are taking money from us and then you should be, maybe I'm ex exaggerating, <laughs> but I wanted to talk to a lawyer friend and then I had an appointment. And in the meantime, you know, these people, the independent unit people, I, I must say they were, they had very good intentions, but they, um, they called me and said they wanted to come and see me. Then they came and see me and saw, uh, said that, um, uh, that, you know, we have to tell you something is that we wanted to pull that contract back from you because we have been asked not to uh, consult with you or discuss. Uh, I said that, look, I have been telling you that I'm willing to help you, but no contract is necessary. Anyway, it was only a $10,000 contract for which I had already spent the time with them. But in any case, um, uh, and I said not to worry about it. There were other things that, which I don't want to discuss now, but there were other things that were involved with it. And these that's why I'm saying this group of um, uh I would say young officials, they were very keen in, uh, in really investigating. However, they were asked not to. And there was like, you know, I mean, I got it in writing that they were asked not to consult with me. So, I mean, this is when you talk about oversight, John, what oversight and who was oversighting, I don't know, really. I mean, they don't, and when they have an evaluation, um, I mean, if they ask them not to talk to people who are critical, oh, we, they were told that don't talk to this person because she is too critical. And um, uh, so, um, and what is too critical? I, I really, I mean, I am very critical, but <laughs> I think Robert would have to laugh because they all tell me that I'm not very diplomatic, actually as a diplomat. Uh, which is perhaps true, but in any case, I mean, this is the first time I'm talking publicly about this, and it's it's very disturbing and very distressing. Well, I think Nipa, that it that it ties into my comments about the, the corrosion um, at at both ends of the spectrum, and um, um, the the price that is paid in terms of honest and effective public administration and good governance. Uh, and, and, and democracy in terms of this proroguing of our parliament that I mentioned, um, and um, and it's 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 um, it, it is deeply disturbing. And John, apropos of your uh, comment um, about the importance of embarking on these lessons learned uh, exercises, which which we haven't done in Canada, and which, as I've said, there seems to be absolutely no political interest in embarking on that kind of a course, but. You mentioned, you know, we say in the U.S. that we're going to pay attention to the lessons learned after Vietnam and then again after Iraq and after Libya and after Afghanistan. And it brings me back to uh, my, uh, and, and I guess we're out of time, but uh, I'll leave you folks again with, uh, with my favorite quotation from uh, Robert Fisk, which is the only thing we ever learn is that we never learn. Well, uh, hopefully we can change that. And uh, but uh, we do have a problem of uh, learning uh, from the past. Uh, and those who don't learn, they tend to repeat uh, the history. Uh, can I just end with one last thing? I think Nipa, I, I don't know anything about the particular case you're talking about it, but it it does raise a concern about uh, uh, you know monitoring and valuation reports if the agencies don't do independent 
truly independent monitoring and evaluation, which Absolutely. means you talk to people who have opinions, even if you don't want to hear the opinions, you do that. And we have heard too many allegations of people. Remember, when a company is hired to do a monitoring and evaluation report for USAID or State Department or a Canadian agency, they're thinking, if I write a negative report, I'm never going to get hired again. Absolutely. And that, okay, that is, is, yes. That's the reason Absolutely. why you want independent oversight. That's okay. why yeah, you have somebody like Cigar. That's why we have okay. 70 independent inspectors general. And I want to just end with this, Daryl. You said, I think we're the only country that does. And uh, you know, I'm appointed by the president on Monday. And on Tuesday, I may be investigating one of the president of the United States' best programs. And I can't be fired or I shouldn't be fired for doing that. I think we're the only country, and I remember speaking around the world, Germany, Norway, Sweden, uh, you name it, and they said, God, we can't believe you have these. And that's the whole concept of independent inspectors general. So I'll put in a little two cents for that is a good thing and we should continue, but they have to be truly independent. Uh, so. No, well, this yeah. our independent unit is not independent because it's within Global Affairs Canada and was advised by somebody very high up in Global Affairs Canada to not consult with me. So, I mean, that independence is not there. By the way, there was another donor who contracted me and then they were accompanying me to some of my preliminary meetings I've had with their um, um, like implementers. And after one or two meetings, they told me, uh, this, this donor government told me that, um, well, you know, I was asking uh, too many questions. And, and that is, and those are not the kind of, the kind of questions I was asking were not the kind of questions they, they want me to ask. So they wanted to, they wanted to um, cut the contract. And I said, absolutely no problem. Um, and, um, and I'm not mentioning the donor, but this is not only Canada and, you know, I, I'm talking about other donors that are pursuing similar kind of policies. So I really don't know what's going, what we are going to do about those things, you know, because it's Afghanistan, it's out, but in other country evaluations, also the same thing happens, perhaps with less uh, damage, but but it does. And so, you know, one of the things that we get out of this is, as you said, that we should have independent monitoring. Really in, um, in Afghanistan, we should not have, even Canada shouldn't have without independent observers. Well, um, uh, I don't know, Nipa, if I'm the coordinator or you're the coordinator, but I see that Anna has logged off. It's 105. I will. I will. Yeah, I will um, close the session and just my usual thanks, etc. It has been, uh, uh, we are now, um, you know, ready to close up the session. It has been a session that is unusually rich in content. Um, uh, um, I thank the audience whose engagement enriched the session. I'm sorry uh, if all their questions haven't been answered. Maybe we should um, look and see if we can um, organize another session sometime. Uh, Daryl, you have shared your perspectives with us after a long while, um, at least with me. Your insights and analysis, the products of your years of research and your in-depth understanding of the issues at hand continue to inspire me. We hope to find you beside us in our trajectory of research, or at least in my trajectory of research at the university. Uh, John, as the Taliban seized control of Afghanistan and chaos and tragedy ensued, I kept thinking of you. Your presentation provides suggestions on realistic ways to address the situation. As always, yours is a voice of sanity amid an emotional and divisive discussion on how to proceed. Your prescriptions are timely. Thank you. I also thank John's team member, Robert Lawrence, who has been very quiet 
sitting through the meeting, but he has been of immense help to me in organizing this event. Thank you, Robert. And by thanking everyone once again, I conclude today's meeting and will we shall see each other soon sometime. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.